Okay, everybody, we are officially going to begin our webinar today. Uh, welcome to you all and welcome to Shervin. We're so excited to have you. Um, before we begin, my name is Nicole Ryle and you are joining us um, through the California Institute for Human Science. If you're unfamiliar with our organization, we are a graduate school and research center focusing on mind, body, spirit, consciousness, education. Um, we also have CIHS Enlighten, which is our public programs division, and um, we're so excited to welcome Shervin today as part of our public programs. In these public programs, we offer continuing education and uh, certificate programs and public offerings like the ones here today. So... Like I said, we're so excited to welcome award-winning musician and sound practitioner Shervin Bolerian for the, he's the founder of Sound Healing Bali. And we're gonna learn about his experience and methodologies for creating sound journeys. He'll lead us today in a discussion about live acoustic natural music, the benefits and why it's so essential in modern age to have this particular modality of multi-instrumental live natural music for healing. We know we all need healing right now. So thank you. Yes. You'll also learn about his upcoming sound healing facilitator training being hosted at CIHS starting December 1st and a super special sound healing experience the night before on November 30th. That's a Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. <clears throat> Well, you're, where you will experience group ceremonial chants and a powerful blend of shamanic, heart, and celestial sounds. So we'll give you a little bit more information on, uh, on that later on in the program. And then just a little bit about Shervin before we turn it over to him. He merges ethnic instruments, sacred music, and healing chants, as well as a classical background in multi-instrumental sound therapy. He launched Bali's first sound healing program at the world-renowned Yoga Barn in 2012. He has since served tens of thousands of guests in over 13 countries worldwide. He is a celebrated vocalist, award-winning natural music artist, certified sound practitioner, and accomplished sound healing teacher trainer. He published his first book, The Three Zones of Sounds, in 2022, and he's the author of numerous articles on the subject of natural healing sound. Shervin combines musical skill and heart-opening vocals as sound medicine for deep relaxation, peace, and connection to the unseen world. His third studio album, I Hear You, Mother Earth, was released in 2020 in response to COVID-19, and he won three Global Peace Song Awards. His prior album, a music for peace collection of Rumi, wisdom, and Persian Sufi-inspired songs was endorsed by worldwide best-selling Rumi translator and poet Coleman Barks. So he's also been feature, a feature presenter at Google offices, MTV Europe, and holistic festivals and sound healing forums. So that is quite an impressive CV there, Shervin, thank you. And I also just wanted to let everybody know that Shervin is joining us live from Bali, where it is 7 a.m. on Wednesday morning. So um, he's got some roosters in the background and um, we're really just fortunate to have this global community where we can have events like this with you across the world, so. Thank you so much, Shervin. Thank you all that are here. Um, we will have uh, time for Q&A at the end of Shervin's presentation. So if you could jot down your questions or hold them off towards the end. And when we get to that point, you can use the Q&A box or you can raise your hand and speak your question to Shervin. So without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Shervin. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Nicole. And thank you to all the community that you're bringing together for this, this yeah. talk. Uh, for also hosting the training that I'll be doing there and the event on the 30th. I'm so excited to launch this partnership with you. And uh, I hope uh, you all won't mind me being a little bit slow today and perhaps uh, <laughs> still waking up. But I'm, uh, I'm here in Bali and we're 15 or 16 hours now ahead of you. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit today about sound. Um, and particularly the importance of natural sound, natural acoustic living sound. I'm guessing from the people in your institute uh, that, that you gather and you learn about sound and sound therapy as one of the, the many modalities of energy work that are out there. 
that are both su supported by science and spirituality simultaneously. And uh, I was very fortunate to have a very um, uh, well-balanced teacher who brought in both of these two elements in a very unique way. His book, The Tao of Sound, his name is Fabien Maman. His book, The Tao of Sound, is considered one of the groundbreaking books of modern sound therapy because in, in that book, he actually looks at blood cells and how they respond to the different uh, stimulation from different instruments, different sound that affects the blood. And he um, not only looked at healthy cancer cells, but he also looked at rogue cells such as HeLa cancer cells, health, healthy hemoglobin on one hand, and then also um, HeLa cancer cells as well. And that was a different set of research. He, he examined how different notes and different sequences of notes would affect the blood, both the healthy blood and the HeLa cancer cells. And he discovered that he could obliterate these cells, the rogue cells in the body through pure use of natural acoustic sound. Now this was back in 1981 at the University of Jussieu in Paris, where he was working with a clinician there to be able to put this, this studies together. And uh, we've come a long way since then, but a lot of what modern science is discovering, it seems, uh, is pretty much reinforcing the fact that sound has an incredible and, and profound effect, not just on the human body, uh, but also on all the different aspects of our way of relating, including on the emotions, including on a mental level, uh, including on levels that have to do with things such as building community, so these are, uh, these are just some of the findings that my teacher passed on to me as part of the research and the training that we did as through the Tamado Academy when I was training with them. And he took all of this research and presented it to the World Research Forum in 1988. But needless to say that his, his quest was to show that natural acoustic sound has relevance today in the world and uh, that there are different ways in which natural sound can work. According to the Samkhya school of Hindu philosophy, sound is not just uh, a sense, sorry, listening is not just a sense that is powerful in its own right, but it also is a wonderful access point to all the other senses, that it is a doorway, an opening, to being connected to all our other senses. According to Russell Paul, who was the author of the Yoga of Sound, he, uh, he says, and, and I'm paraphrasing, and this is not an exact quote, but he suggests that we have lost the art of listening today. And that has created the backdrop for a lot of the problems we have in, in the world, that we, have, we are in a space where we are, uh, all of our problems, human-made problems have been intensified by the fact that we cannot listen to each other. And so he's suggesting that it's part of our destiny to even survive as a race, to be able to regain this art of listening that we have lost now. And there are several reasons for why it's so hard to be able to risk to listen and i'll go into that. Uh, because it's almost become like a hazardous thing to open ourselves up to listen uh, it's we are overwhelmed with so much stress and noise and the nervous system is overloaded we are dealing with so much information and having to process information. Our lives are more accelerated today than they've ever been. And uh, we are left with less and less trust in our ability to, to listen in a deeper way, less trust in ourselves uh, and others. 
because we are just so unclear. Um, there are 27% of those polled, according to the American Psychological Association, are not able to function because the stress levels are so high in our modern day lives. Cannot function, almost a third of Americans cannot function. And that's a, that's a huge tragedy. That's a massive uh, blot on our ability to just be still. 60% uh, of disease, according to the American, American Medical Association, is related to stress. And noise is one of the agitators of stress. Human-made noise is creating a lot of this reduction in our tolerance. And so, uh, particularly the people who are sensitive out there, we have a choice of either numbing ourselves, withdrawing to the point where we can manage certain things, it filters other things, and we also are forced to outsource our choices when it comes to what kind of decisions we want to make in our lives. Against this backdrop, we are having to, dis to discern, you know, what is best for ourselves? What can we do for ourselves when it comes to the world of healing, when it comes to the world of choosing um, what kind of modality to use and then what aspects of that modality According to Dr. Jeffrey Thompson, who is a well-known psychoacoustician, psychoacoustics is the study of sound as a, a means of being able to alter and specifically slow down the brain waves uh, using various different programs. Often we put headphones on and listen, and these programs come in and help us to adjust the brain waves to different, different states of consciousness. And even Dr. Jeffrey Thompson, when he's really kind of pressed and he says, well, what is it that we can do to get back in touch with ourselves so that we can live more fulfilling lives? He doesn't say it's one of his programs, to take one of his programs. He says, take 30 minutes and go into nature. Take 30 minutes and put yourself in that place where you can receive an experience that is natural. Uh, and other different aspects of nature that are incredibly important to you. And, and the importance varies based on what it is that you need. And that's something that any of you who have studied Ayurveda or Chinese medicine will know. There are times when we need certain types of energies. It's not just nature on its own. There are what, what aspects of nature? Is it the water, the sound of the water, being close to the ocean as you are in San Diego over there? Sounds of uh, the, the wind in, in, the, in the leaves, when in the forests, sounds of, um, you know, what it's like to be on top of a mountain and the crystal clarity kind of the majestic experience of being there. There's all different ways in which nature can work and it's no accident when you're drawn to different aspects of nature. But this is an expert on psychoacoustics and he's explaining a paradox here that we have this wonderful body of, of uh, digital and um, digital programs that we can use and you take use to our advantage but he is saying that this is really a top thing that you can do to better know yourself. David Gibson, who is a person in charge of the Sound Consciousness Institute in Northern California, he's also the author of The Complete Guide to Sound Healing, very respected. Uh, and he also works with vibroacoustics, which is the idea that you can find a frequency that is needed for you specifically on a bodily level. Perhaps you have an organ that is out of, of alignment or needs extra support. So you have a frequency of that organ that then can get introduced to the body and you know, these different devices that can do that. And that that can bring about a sense of better harmonization 
and support based on that specific frequency that is directed to you. But even he will agree, and this is a, these are top names in the field, that there's too much disagreement in the field of sound therapy to be able to say that there is this perfect frequency for this and that perfect frequency for that. So that creates this sense of, um, you, this sense of there is no best frequency, there is no ideal perfect frequency. And he will say that what is the best frequency? His answer would be, well, you know what's best for you. The best frequency is what it is that you best discern for yourself. And, and that's another, another paradox. Someone who has created all these thousands of programs, you have to choose yourself, he's essentially saying. And uh, I just want to say that, you know, one of the reasons why it's so hard to be able to discern what the perfect frequency is for people is that we go through different shifts and changes in our lives. We go through natural evolutions. We go through growth. We, our whole body goes through a cellular rebirth every seven years. What may have been good for us at a certain stage of our lives, you know, 15, 20 years ago, is not necessarily good for us now, or it may not be what's best for us now. So these, these shifts and changes that go on for us are an indicator that we are, we are always growing and, and, and gaining different awareness in our lives. So this paradox creates what, what I feel is a, a mirror situation in the sense that we're being told that here are some wonderful two branches of sound therapy in the Western world, psychoacoustics, vibroacoustics, and yet we're not able to really um, get beyond the idea that we have to choose for ourselves and it's important simultaneously to experience nature on a daily basis, according to Dr. Thompson. This uh, kind of creates what I find is a perfect uh, opportunity to really bring in some third alternative. And that's what I'm advocating for, is the need for natural acoustic living sound as a way to both help with the discernment in terms of providing people an energy compass, and also to be able to help with, you know, the benefits of what goes along with sound therapy, which essentially is to relax and to help people feel more connected to themselves. So uh, I wanted to just talk a little bit about why it is that natural sound, acoustic sound is so good for us and why it should be considered as one of those areas which is worthy of the attention and level of scholarly, um, uh, you know, uh, respect that these other levels of sound therapy do as well. How is it that natural sound can create this extra level of discernment? Well, on one level, I'll go through a few few, maybe four different ways in which we can gain and, and learn from natural sound. The first one is that the natural sound journey is there when it's done right to kind of be a reflection of the life journey. That there is a correspondence between the frequencies themselves uh, when they're presented in these types of settings with natural sound. Correspondence with life. And what I mean by that is that when you're dealing with a multitude of different types of sound. Uh, you are able to discern yourself in those moments when these sounds are being delivered to you in such a way. Which of these sounds are really resonating? Which of these sounds I have a sense of me feeling like, yes, I'm, I'm magnetized. I can draw in these sounds. And which of these sounds do I have perhaps a, a contraction against? And these, are, these are some uh, ways in which we can learn about resonance 
by having that multitude shared with us and by having a sense of what it is to be able to experience the buffet of, of live acoustic sound. The low frequencies, for example, if we're drawn to those low frequencies, they have a physical inducing quality to them. They help us to feel more connected to low frequency sounds of bass bring us into the body, bring us into connection with the earth itself. We can all relate to that because when we hear rhythm, when we hear bass, those of us who really love and are drawn to these sounds will know that that's, if that's where we hang out, that that's, you know, um, that there is a deeper connection or a deeper desire to be in connection with that physicality. You hear the bass sounds, you hear the rhythm. Some of us naturally want to move. The sounds penetrate into the tissue. Low frequency penetrates into the tissue. There is a lesson to be gained there. There's information to be gained there as to whether that resonates with us or simultaneously if we're people who have trouble being in our bodies. Perhaps we've had to experience some kind of traumatic episode and we shoot out of our bodies. We can't feel comfortable being at ease in a physical, in our own physical bodies, you know, just, to, just to be present in that area. Uh, the, the physical sounds, which I call the shamanic sounds, help us in that connection. Then we go into more of the mid-range sounds. And the mid-range corresponds with the, if you're, in, if you're familiar with the chakra system, the fourth and the fifth chakras, the heart and the throat. And we're here now going from what might be called the lower Dantian to the mid Dantian, where the emotional world is much more available to us. And perhaps that is a space where we're feeling we want more connection or we feel perhaps a level of being blocked. It's not easy to feel safe at all in the Western world to just be able to feel, to feel that it's okay uh, to let emotions come to the surface. It's like we have to apologize for our emotions. We haven't received a lot of um, openness from society, sometimes from our families, to just be able to feel in a safe way. And yet music has that amazing ability to bring those things to the surface. So in this particular zone, we're dealing with more of the melodic sounds of the strings, instruments like the piano, the guitar, flute, instruments that help to uh, convey a message of, of the emotions, things that you cannot put into words often. And that's, uh, that can help to regain a level of understanding and appreciation and connection there. And that's one area that you don't often see, unfortunately, in the world of sound therapy. It's one area that's often glossed over. We hear a lot of the shamanic sounds that sounds of the intensity of the gongs. We also hear a lot of the bowls and the bells, which to, to me constitute more of the celestial sounds, which I'll go into in a second. But the heart is heart opening sounds, strings, uh, flutes, they, they are not often shared in such a way or grouped in such a way that can help those things come to the surface. And we're dealing with the higher frequencies or the celestial sounds, these kinds of instruments like the bowls and the bells that help us to get more of a sense of what's happening up here. And in this, in this area, there is a high level of sensitivity. Even if you just touch your face, your chin, your lips, your ears, we, these are, this is a very receptive part of the body. It's almost like the antenna of the body. And so it has a great deal of connection to to a spacious quality, uh, the instruments that help to allow us to feel more emptiness and connection to spaciousness, uh, uh, an opportunity to decompress and let the thoughts that may have built up to stress to kind of reduce that, reduce the pressure on that. That can also be available to us from those higher frequencies, the clarity of the mental space, physical, emotional, mental. These are the three different areas in which sound can help to be able to be a teacher 
in terms of where it is that we hang out, generally speaking, not with precise frequencies, in terms of the quality and the energy of the sounds, where do we hang out? And where do we have perhaps some blockages or some resistance? Uh, the next way in which sound, natural sound can help beyond just being a compass in that regard is that it helps when you're dealing with a living situation. And if you have a practitioner who's trained and able to be present with the receiver, then that in itself will allow the, uh, the feeling that there is a, a, a real, real level of, of connection. That if the sounds are being played in a certain way and the, re and the receiver is responding, that we have an ability to read how that response is and adjust. Presence is a huge uh, part of listening. In a recording setting, you can't really have that presence. There isn't that human agency. So me to be able to read and feel and respond and adjust is going to require there for, for there to be a real-time connection with a real human being. And that's also part of what builds presence in the listener when they're when the receiver, when they are noticing that there is a response and an ability to say, look, there's you know, maybe my sound, the sounds of the dog and the, and the rooster are going to affect the way in which I play. Because I'm, less, I'm noticing that that's in the background. And so there are ways in which the adjustment has to be paid attention to in real time, in the moment. How many practitioners can really say that they're really in the moment when working with just these digital programs may not be possible in that regard. The third thing is that you get more of an experience of nature coming into a, a real experience of being in nature with these natural sounds, if they're grouped together in a right way where they can recreate the feeling of being in a forest or being surrounded by water, uh, that these have a, a quality of being able to transfer those energies of nature in a living setting for the receiver and that builds that connection to nature. It's, it's, I'm sure that there are wonderful digital programs that can help us also with these great effects, putting us into a scenario where we feel like we're in a rainforest or we can have a digital screen presenting it to us. And it could be incredibly high resolution, wonderful uh, image, images and sounds, but it's just not the same as living quality of being in a room with the sounds themselves creating these natural overtones. And according to my teacher, the overtones are one of the most important aspects of healing sound, that space in between the tones, where these overtones, these natural layers, when you hit a fundamental tone, as I'm doing on this guitar right now, fundamental tone we hear it it's there it's very present but what we don't notice is there is a subtlety going on with these other layers of sound that are coming on top of that fundamental tone and those of you who have studied the overtone sequence will know according to pythagoras at least it's the most important mathematical sequence in life uh, in terms of it when you do when you map it that you can find that that overtone sequence creates a perfect spiral. Some call it the Fibonacci sequence, the golden ratio, the phi ratio, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But these are only really evident in natural acoustic sounds, and there's something about that which I feel is essential in that quality of being able to come into appreciation of that subtle awareness, of that feeling of non-point, you know, immersion which you can't often get. Perhaps you can recreate it, you can try to simulate it, but it's not the same as being in that real experience. So there's that aspect of the overtones, the subtlety, the all directions, the 3D experience with sound in a living real-time environment. And by the way, those overtones, they match the DNA strands, you know, they match the the dimensions of our body, 
they match you know the movement of the of the galaxy there's something very mystical and powerful about that the the chakra system if you believe in it series of these spirals and to me there's something about those spirals that can be created through natural living sound that interacts with that space between physical and non-physical reality and bring us into harmony from that. The last thing is that uh, it's kind of related to the last point, but there is a resensitization process that comes with subtle natural acoustic sound, the, the hidden messages of the sounds, the magnetizing quality we, I can tell you when I was in Washington DC before I was an advisor to members of Congress and to senators there on the issues of uh, Middle East and peace and, um, and of course that we weren't making a lot of progress back then uh, and the situation now is, is quite is heartbreaking for me to witness. But this is, this is where we have a numbing that has gone on and I was someone who was, I was an intensity junkie. I would go to concerts, I would want to push myself right to the front, right in front of the blasting massive speakers that are bigger than I was. And uh, every week I would go and try to look for something even more intense and, and, and numb myself even more. And that's been a, my reaction to the world of overwhelm. And I don't think I'm the only one in the professional world. So this resensitization process that is related to the, what I said about the Samkhya school, that access point to the other senses, becomes really clear in this world with these, these hidden messages of those natural sounds. Uh, they connect you to, um, to that part of you that is wanting to speak to you from a deeper place. And it replaces that need for high intensity and pushing and, and loudness and even more noise. So that's also a benefit on top of all of the relaxation and peace that these sounds can be created. I will say that these qualities are not going to be available to the listener if you don't have a trained practitioner who knows what they're doing. And that's part of the issue of today is that 90% of the people who I call peers are really not trained. They're musicians, they're uh, you know, music teachers, they used to play in an orchestra, they were rock and rollers for 15 years. But uh, there is a big stark difference, for all the reasons that I just listed, a big stark difference between sound as energy and sound as entertainment. And we don't often realize how important that is. So all of this it comes back to this question of self-responsibility in this world where we are told more and more to not take responsibility, to let someone else make those decisions for us. But that connection to nature is truly that access point to inner nature. And if we can recreate those kinds of environments through sound, through a modality that can bring so much universal understanding and acceptance, then I believe that our healing journey is, is available to us, that we can go through those experiences of shifts and change of knowing what is discern, discerning what is good for us so that these other branches of, of therapy can be available to us in a more meaningful way, in a more informed way. And, um, and what, is, what is it that life is about? It's not really about fixing and coming into a place where you just need to fix something that's in the holistic arts I'm told that that's the last thing we want to do uh, we want to be able to realize that life is a journey itself like a sound journey of coming into wholeness coming into appreciation and acceptance of the full spectrum to become well-rounded beings that's our goal that's our aim and I believe that this world of natural sound with its ability to connect us to these different realms of reality, different dimensions of human existence, physical, emotional, mental, is the ideal way to do that and the ideal complement to these other forms of sound therapy that exists. 
because they can bring in nature and because they allow us to discern for ourselves what resonates. And from there, resonance as a way of life, which is the topic of this talk, can start to become a part of our reality because we can really truly come into those places where we can make decisions based on what is resonating, what kind of food we ingest in our bodies from that place of stillness, not from overwhelm, what kind of food we ingest, what kind of people we introduce in our lives, what kind of work we want to do for ourselves, what kind of situations we expose ourselves to, and the list goes on and on. We are able to claim responsibility for our lives when we have these kinds of added awarenesses. So that's uh, in a nutshell my talk. I hope uh, that this helps to be, I hope it's clear enough and it wasn't rambled on too much because of my <laughs> early morning state, but I'm more interested now in your questions and how you, how you feel about these points that I raised for you today. Thank you so much, Shervin. That was excellent. Um, and thank you for bringing up the title Residence as a Resonance, excuse me, as a way of life. Um, it definitely came through in your talk. And one of the takeaways or a couple of takeaways I got, one, I loved how you uh, kind of made the differentiation between sound as energy and sound as entertainment. Um, you know, sound healing has gotten pretty popular here, especially in Southern California. And um, yeah, I think it's really important to make that distinction and, you know, set that intention at the beginning of a presentation or a concert or, or whatever it may be. Um, that's a very important distinction. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Great. And um, I'll, I'll put a couple links in the chat box for everybody. Um, uh, the first link to our con Sherman's concert on uh, Thursday, November 30th. Um, that is completely open to the public and to our CIHS community, to the Encinitas community, to the San Diego community. So um, we'd love to see some of your local faces there. And then Sherman is also extending his early bird discount to the four day um facilitator sound training that he will be um, doing at CIHS. And that is December 1st through December 4th. So I'll get ready to um, put those both in the chat box for you all, direct links if you can sign up. <clears throat> um, and then if you would like to um, ask Shervin a question, you can use the raised hand function and um, I can, um, then you can unmute yourself and speak your question and have a little conversation with Shervin if you'd like. You can also use the Q&A box. And I think I saw somebody um, pop into the chat box. Yeah, um, James, thanks James. He said, your points were very well communicated. Where does the didgeridoo resonate with your chakra explanation? It's in the low frequency zone for me. So I put it with the shamanic instruments, the more ancient instruments, the instruments that can be more percussive and that have this quality of kind of earthing and grounding ourselves and putting us into connection with the earth. And uh, just in the way that it's been used historically, I think we can, we can make that linkage just, just from that alone. But the feel of the experience of the didgeridoo, particularly when it's played with sensitivity, has that depth of quality of putting us into the empowerment through the earth. And I thank you for the question. Yes. Thank you, James. You're a familiar name. So it's nice to see some of our community out here. Welcome. Okay. Hang on one second. Nicole. Yeah. Nicole, if you'd like to um, unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Hi there. Um, I am wondering how amplification affects these things that you have been talking about. Does it remove or dampen the experience? And how do you then um, decide what sort of size of a group that you're going to work with if you're trying to avoid amplification and really have the pure sounds thank you nikali that's a great question and it's something that we come up against so much now in modern 
presentations of sound and music where it's kind of expected for us to just uh, amp everything up. Um, my personal desire is to find a place which has beautiful acoustics so that you don't need amplification or minimal amplification. Uh, the amplification is something that is sometimes necessary uh, because, for example, when I'm in Bali and I'm, I've got these high ceilings around me and, and no walls typically uh, in these yoga shalas or places that I'm expected to play, then I have to really think about uh, whether I just need a little added touch. But I, even when I use amplification, it may just be for the first part where we're doing a singing circle and doing mantras and chanting together. And then I actually try to phase it out so that I get the group to feel a sense of what it's like to not have to deal with the amplifi amplifier and just feel like what it is to, f to experience natural sound without you know, often having to cringe or you know, if there's a sudden spike or some big feedback that comes in that causes that reaction. So um, I, I would just, yeah, encourage you where you can to minimize the amplifying uh, forces out there, the electric forces out there and see what happens, you know. Again, it's, it's so much, there's such a different experience in your, in your ability to relate to energy when it's, magnet, when it's a magnetic experience rather than an electric one. And uh, it, it's, it's something that I'm hoping that the world of live music is going to transform. We're going to have a, entirely different designs of our venues that will put natural acoustic sound first, the way they did, you know, in the, in the, in the pyramids and the Parthenon and, you know, all of these areas which had natural, amazing acoustics, ancient study of, of, of architecture sacred architecture that took into, took these things into account where the buildings themselves were created as if they were the echo chambers of instruments. And that would be an amazing experience. That would, that would completely revolutionize our experience of live music if we were to put less uh, emphasis on, on amplification and much more so on the experience of the living sound. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you, Nikoli. Um, we have another question from Mar Jasanov, maybe. Um, excuse me if I didn't pronounce that correctly, but um, feel free to in, uh, unmute yourself. Hi. Hi, thank you. And thank you, Shervin, for a very, I, I gained a lot from your words. Um, my question is about um, I have moved into as, to the life of being a sound healer. As a beginner, I am looking for a training program because I feel like I want to go deeper. But aside from that, my question is about in choosing an instrument, for example. So I have chosen a um, crystal singing practitioner and um, have been getting advice from the person I'm working with. And she's very knowledgeable and she knows crystal singing bowls very well. But I find that I'm choosing the bowl that most resonates with my DNA, with me, rather than something that's recommended. Is mm. that something a sound practitioner healer should be doing? Or what, what angle do you come at with that? That's a very good question. So if I'm, if I'm getting you correctly, it's your ability, your, your connection is to the crystal bowl and that you are discovering that you are your personal way of relating to that bowl and the frequency that you are drawn to is not the same as what your your teacher is is telling you is that correct she's she's experienced and i've just met her and she's she has all these bowls so i'm choosing one of her bowls but what i find interesting and i'm trusting myself that i'm a musician too i'm a vocalist i'm a singer yes. and the the bowl that sings to me you know the song that you know when it penetrates the vibration of the voice for example into the body that that sound that penetrates into me that is i mean there's nothing like it that is the bowl that i i'm attracted to and she's talking to me about like concert hertz and lots of different qualities of 
of the bowl. And I'm just, I'm trusting me, but I, I just wanted to know, I, you've played so many of these instruments. What Do you have any advice for moving forward as I invest in these instruments? Right. <clears throat> I would um, tend to agree with you that what works for you is what works for you whether it's 432 or 440 or whether it's this note or that note it's really got to be more about what resonates for you and what works for you and also as a singer what works when you when you introduce your voice as a, something that can uh, kind of blend with your voice but i would ask you to just consider a couple of things the first thing is to consider what type of bowl it is itself, not in terms of like whether it's gem infused or this or that, that in itself is one thing, but whether or not it is one of the larger bowls, is it a mid-size, is it a small one? These also can give you a sense of the low, mid and high and where you hang out and your, your personal compass in terms of determining where it is that you hang out is going to help you figure out not only where your superpower is in terms of where you can help others access a connection to sound, but it also helps you to determine, and this is important for every practitioner, to know where the areas are where you're feeling some contraction and some resistance. I don't believe that we can be truly able to work with sound, living sound, in a way that is kind of supportive to others if we can't navigate that full spectrum ourselves and understand where it is in life we may be having blockages. Thank because you that's, so much for saying that, yeah. That's the teaching right there in the, in the instruments. That's when you can really get a moment to really learn from the instrument itself as well as be able to come forward with your own gift and your own place of, of power yeah whether it's those low mid or high frequencies you yourself are going to be able to determine in chinese medicine as with ayurveda excess in one area is a recognition of depletion in the other so it's an important thing for you to know not only where your strength is, but also where you are also needing more attention yourself and work with those frequencies too. Thank you so much. It's, I'm, I'm talking to this person online. So it's, it's buying a crystal bowl virtually. Is this even possible? <laughs> in I, your I, opinion? I always, <laughs> I'm always someone who likes to be able to have the instrument in front of me to test it and feel it and sense it, connect with it, build a relationship with it. But, and this is part of that, there's, there's a shamanic aspect of being able to do this work, the energy aspect of doing this work effectively. But that being said, so much of what we order on is online now. So um, if there is a way for you to hear it, hear it both being tapped and sung and, and rung and, you know, different ways in which you can listen to it and really tune in, that might be helpful. Thank you. Thanks so much. Yes, thank you for your question. Um, we have a couple questions, Sherman, about your training. Um, someone is asking if you could tell us a little bit about what you'll cover in your four day training. And then more specifically, uh, will you be training with various instruments, bring your own or some other type of um, training. So if you just want to speak a little bit about the training, that would be great. I'll answer the second question first. You can, we will have all the instruments that you need there. We will have right. uh, the different instruments that you will work with. It's going to be multi-instrumental. Every day you will come into connection with a different grouping of these instruments and you will learn to work with them. We have a different keyword that we explore. We do a little bit of theory but then you're going to be practicing on each other and having time to work and, and really see the effects of what it's like to work with each other with those instruments. We also work with the voice. Voice is applied in all three zones. There are three different styles of voice that I bring you into connection with. 
that accompanies the different instruments that work in those zones. We work with drum, prayer drums, excuse me. We work with the percussion instruments. We work with the bowls, both metal and crystal. We work with strings to go into the heart. And we work with the, with the very light, delicate sounds uh, of, of what I call ether two, the sounds that are very expansive, uh, the, the wind chimes and the bells, and those kinds of instruments as well. So you have a full, full experience. The gongs will be in there. And uh, it just provides the foundation of the training that I, that I do. This is my book. It's, it's out of print right now because I'm working on a second edition with someone in San Diego who's one of my students, who's also a professor at the University of San Diego. And uh, she, she and I are working on the second edition of this, which we'll publish. But in the meantime, you will get handouts every day. You will have chapters from this book as the pamphlet, the course pamphlet. Every day I give you different questions to explore yourself to go into your own personal world of how sound interacts with you and where there may be areas for you to bring more of your attention and awareness to enhance your listening skills and your ability to do this work for others. So it's each day you do a different zone and then on the last day you give a presentation in a team to two others, one or two others, where you put into practice what you've learned and the whole group gets to receive from you and then you can, um, you can get feedback from me and everybody else in the group in a very caring and loving way and supportive way. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, my understanding of it is a very dynamic uh, training, very interactive and experiential. So um, it's going to be a real treat to have you. <laughs> We have one more question um, from Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Can you, she's, she's asking, um, can you share how the voice relates to the natural sound journey and benefits of voice? Yes. So um, I did mention my teacher, Fabien Mamon, at the beginning of this talk. And his, his conclusion was of all the different instruments that were studied, that the human voice was the most effective at empowering the healthy blood cells and uh, obliterating the rogue cells. And this we all know intuitively, we have such a deep connection to the human voice. It's such a primal instrument. It's the first instrument that ever existed before there were drums and rattles. We were expressing with the voice. The voice is connected to our anatomy. It's the bridge between here and here in this beautiful tunnel that creates uh, so much expression and sense of self and identity. It's also an area where we have so many hangups and so much um, personal hurt when it comes to the voice. We've swallowed our voices so much. In the modern world, our voices have become shrunk to these devices. We don't even call anybody anymore. We have to text them first and ask them. It's a very strange world where the voice has started to lose its uh, quality of, of expression, of meaningful expression. So we learn about mantra. We learn about, uh, we do voice exercises every day to open the voice and to bring us into connection with the voice. And we learn about the different ways in which the voice can work with these different zones as they pertain to a multi-instrumental sound journey. And everybody can be able to access these spaces. Everybody can be able to use their voices in some way, fashion or another. Most of my students who come to my sessions don't have any musical experience or background. They've never sung in public before. By the end of the course, they're sharing with the group, sharing their voices for the first time, and they're realizing how liberating it is to be able to do that. And they're realizing what an effect it has on the, the receivers when the human voice is introduced in a sincere and very, uh, very honest and, and uh, genuine way. It can do so much more than someone who has incredible technique and knows all of the, you know, mastery. They can be so distant from that experience of real connection. This goes back to what you said about entertainment and energy. We know what it feels like when something really touches us. And it isn't always but it's incredible technical skill. It has to do with the intention and the heart behind what's said or done or expressed. 
Yes, that's so beautiful. Um, well, thank you again, Shervin. Um, we're really looking forward to having you in a few weeks. It'll be a beautiful kind of kickoff to the holiday season for us as well. Um, I did have one um, tidbit of information to share with you. We have one of our um, CIHS trustees in the audience today, and um, he let me know that Dr. Thompson is a longtime faculty member at CIHS. Yes. So yeah, very small so world. Cool. I'm very glad to have uh, brought his name in. And I, yeah, I'm a big admirer of his work and I'm really yeah. grateful for pointing that out. Thank you so much. I hope to, uh, to connect with him. Yes, I know. Maybe we can um, you know, have some future offerings or have you as a guest lecturer at CIHS for some of our academic programs as well. That would be great. I'd be delighted. Yes. All right, everybody. Well, um, I put a bunch of links and email contact information in the chat box. So please reach out if you have any questions to either myself or to Shervin. And um, if you're new to CIHS, welcome. We are so happy that you are here. If you're local, we hope you can join us for Shervin's upcoming events and trainings. And um, once again, thank you so much for getting up so early in Bali and joining us. <laughs> Um, we're very grateful that you're here and that you'll have um, uh, a physical presence at CIHS in a few weeks. So thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, Shervin. All right. Have a oh, great afternoon. Have a great Wednesday in Bali and everybody here. Have a great afternoon and evening. And we will see you soon. This recording will be available in a few days. So I'll send it out. Thank mm. you, sir. Thanks, everyone.